<laughs> this is our last video and hopefully it will be short and it's on forensic interviewing of children who have been sexually abused. Now forensic interviews takes its name from the word forensic and forensic when you hear it should uh, has connotations of legal uh, investigation finding something out uh, and it uh, it's a forensic interviewing is an interview that is structured that's set up so meet the standards of evidence in um, criminal court Parents or others, people who have sexually abused children are charged with criminal sexual conduct. And there are five degrees of criminal sexual conduct and they can have one charge or several charges. So it's, it's part of criminal law. And that's why people who conduct forensic interviews spend a long time figuring out how to do the interview so that they'll hold up in a court of law. Now you learn from a previous video that most children who are sexually abused uh, do not testify in court for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is the fact that kids, very young children, can actually be cross-examined and treated like they're not telling the truth. And so um, if somebody sexually abuses a three-year-old or a four-year-old, they're almost guaranteed to get away with it unless they admit it. And that's the plain hard fact of, of uh, child sexual abuse. So forensic interviewing is a structured approach to talking to children for the specific purpose of providing evidence to the police and the courts in the investigation and prosecution of persons alleged to have sexually abused children. Trained professionals conduct these interviews. Parents are not present. Today, we will consider, uh, we will discuss interviews with children who may have been sexually abused. This interview gathers information about the nature of the abuse, the identification of the abuser or abusers. Any hint that the interviewer suggests answers to the children threatens the quality of the evidence. So in other words, you have to have questions that don't imply any answer. This discussion is intended to provide a brief overview of forensic interview, interviewing. It does not prepare professionals to be competent interviewers. Professionals become competent as interviewers through in-depth training, supervision, and then long-term uh, experience that includes close supervision. Effective interviews builds upon children's levels of development and thus use questions and other techniques that are concrete and specific. The interviews are structured and typically progress in stages. They begin with preparing children, move to discussing the abuse scenario, and end with a structured uh, closure. And some forms of forensic interviewing, the interview is videotaped while police, child protection social workers, and prosecuting attorneys observe the interview in another room through closed circuit videoing. These observers can phone interviewers to ask for further detail. These uh, professionals are key players in the prosecution of child sexual abuse cases. Having them present at the interview minim minimizes the number of times children are interviewed. And it really is important to limit the number of times that children are interviewed. Some jurisdictions fund agencies whose sole purpose is to interview children who have experienced various forms of, of abuse and neglect, but typically there's a big focus on child sexual abuse. The children, children are interviewed in a child-friendly space with comfortable seating and where the interviewers are at the same level as the children, are sitting at the same level as the children. These agencies often have volunteers who greet the children and families and who stay with the children in child-friendly waiting rooms as professionals gather uh, information from parents. 
So it's important to prepare children for these interviews because it's not an everyday occurrence for children to be talking to strangers about being sexually abused. So forensic interviews take place in the unfamiliar setting of a hospital-based evaluation center or a police station or a, uh, an agency that is set up specifically to interview children. Children, understandably, are typically very anxious. The interviewing room typically is child-friendly with beanbag chairs and decorations in primary colors. Interviewers in introduce themselves and use the children's names right away. Police stations, on the other hand, may be drab. Interviewers check to see if the children know why they are there and describe what is going to happen in the interview. That's really important. Children need to know that you're here because uh, we believe that Uncle Tom or uh, Auntie Margaret uh, touched you uh, in uh, some of the private parts of your body and that is not allowed and so we want to get more information about this so we can make sure that they don't do this to you or to any other children. That's the kind of thing that is said, although you would have to know what specific agencies want their trained personnel to say. So the first step after those preliminaries is to try to build rapport. Children, uh, interviewers want children to feel as if they have some control over the interview process. They begin evidence gathering, because that's what it is, evidence gathering, by saying, I'm going to be drawing things about you on this paper. I will ask you to tell me what to draw. Now, the interview I am talking about relies on drawings. Other interviews uh, might have anatomical dolls, although there's some controversy about that. So, but, but children need to have something concrete and specific to describe um, about the sexual abuse because their experience is specific and concrete and also typically they're thinking about the abuse in concrete and specific ways. So the interviewers show the children the marking pens and newsprint on which the interviewers will draw. And again, in this interview that I'm describing, the interviewers do the drawing and not the children. And they sometimes will use ready-made drawings as well, but when they're drawing the house or the setting in which the abuse took place, there aren't any preset um, line drawings for that. So doing drawings of the setting where the child, where the abuse took place, uh, build rapport and provide evidence that is used in the investigation and may be used in court. Interviewers ask for the names of the people in the family and draw them. They also ask about the layout of the family home and draw that. For example, in obtaining information about who is in the child's family, a, a usual question is, does mommy have short, medium, or long hair, straight, wavy, or curly? Interviewers immediately draw the correct kind of hair on the figure of the mother. In conversations with the children, the interviewers add the sexual body parts to the drawing, such as vulva, breast, penis, and buttocks. Interviewers then ask the children the names they use for the various body parts. In this way, interviewers learn the names that children use. Then they ask for the terms themselves. Now, um, I'm reading from notes, and the notes aren't quite accurate, so just take a step back now and forgive me for not um, being totally organized in this part of, of what I'm saying, but first you draw the family. And the family isn't necessarily the abuser, so once you finish knowing who's in the family, uh, then you'll draw the house, then you'll draw this, the house the child lives in, and typically the abuse takes place in the child's house. But if it doesn't, then you would draw where the abuse took place. Then um, you ask about who is the person who touched you in, in places that they should not have, or whatever the agency wants you to say. And then you draw those people. You'll draw the child, you'll draw the, perp the perpetrators. And uh, the child will tell you very interesting details, like if, if the perpetrator had a walrus mustache, the child is going to describe that. So 
<coughs> with um, with the child and with the perpetrator, the interviewer will draw the with the sexual body parts, but they won't draw them on the family members. There's no need to do that. So the drawings will include vulvas, breasts, penises, and buttocks. Interviewers then ask the children the names they use of the various body parts. In this way, interviewers learn the names the children use. Then they use the same terms themselves. And we've already uh, had a lecture on that, how important it is to use the same terms that the children do. Interviewers ask the children to, buy, to describe the layout of their homes, which I already said. And um, as the children answer simple concrete questions and the interviewers draw what the children tell them, the ch t children typically enjoy the process and share a great deal. It's really something when children feel as if somebody's listening to them and what they're listening to has an effect, which is a drawing, it's really uh, empowering the children. They feel special. The children are the experts on their own families. Interviewers typically are not skilled in drawing, but the children d never seem to mind. So don't be self-conscious if you have to do some of this drawing that you're not a very good drawer. If it's, if you can sort of tell who it is, and that's good enough. Um, so the touch inquiry. Once you have the alleged perpetrator, the child, uh, the family, the setting drawn, then you ask the children to describe what happened. So when the time comes to describe the sexual abuse, many children have enough of a sense of safety, you've created a safe haven in other words, to answer the questions. The interviewers ask things, is there any place on your body that you like to be touched? Once the children answer, the, inter the interviewer asks, who touches you there? And sometimes, sometimes they might talk about how they like to be touched on their head or they like to be touched on the, the back of their necks or their shoulders or their hands. And then the interviewer will ask, who touches you there? The interviewer may ask then, is there any place on your body you don't like to have touched? When the child answers, the interviewer then asks, who touches you there? Some may point to a drawing and say the names. When the interviewers use anatomically detailed dolls, the children can show what kinds of sexual acts constitute the abuse. Interviewers will also ask where the abuse happened, what they saw, what they heard, smelled, and sometimes even tasted. They may ask if the abuse took place anywhere else and if anyone else touched them on their private body parts. You use the words the children use. I can't emphasize that enough. The drawings of the layout of the house help the children to answer these questions. When the time comes to describe the sexual abuse incidents, um, some children can do describe the concrete details if you ask for them. And the concrete details are important for a lot of reasons. One is it's the kind of information that parents would like to have later because if children have, uh, you know, traumatic flashbacks, which many do, related to the sexual abuse, the flashbacks are often um, set off by the details surrounding the abuse and not necessarily um, and, the, and those details if the parents don't know them they might not understand why the children are dysregulating as they may do uh, so it's really important for parents to know uh, what the children re remember about the details surrounding the abuse I've given this example before in class but it, it really stands out uh, a little girl who was sexually abused was placed in a bathroom while her abuser was answering the door and in the bathroom there was a flashing purple light and she remembers that detail to this day and so she sees a, 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 a flashing purple light she remembers the abuse now she doesn't go into a deep dysregulation where she'll throw things or have tantrums or or have any exaggerated dysregulations <coughs> but she does she does remember, she does have flashbacks, and she might temporarily disconnect from the present as she's thinking about the flashing purple light and what the flashing purple light uh, reminds her of. Ending well is very important. Children have just discussed an upsetting event. The interviewers show sensitivity to children, because don't forget, all interviewing, forensic or informal or casual interviewing, always is 
sensitive and responsive to children. The interviewer is totally focused on the child and the interviewer is emotionally available to the child. So the interviewer shows sensitivity to children when they help children make plans of action as to what they can do to protect themselves in the future. Uh, of course, the protection is never guaranteed. Possible questions include, if this happens again, who can you talk to? They may also ask, is there anything you'd like to say to the abuser? Sometimes um, they'll have the children draw a hand, draw their hands, and they'll put names of people they might be able to trust. When anything happens to them that's upsetting to them, the interviewers then walk the children to the waiting room where their parents are. Children feel supported and encouraged when adults take them seriously, pay attention to what they say, and give them guidelines about what to do in other possible um, abuse situations. Now this interview uh, can be adapted to other forms of maltreatment such as sexual harassment physical abuse, sibling teasing, or other forms of verbal abuse. Uh, it can be used in bullying incidents, witnessing domestic abuse, or other traumas such as seeing a friend shot, which is not an uncommon occurrence for many kids who live in high crime areas. Now this, this uh, discussion of forensic interviewing is based on um, an interview uh, uh, that um, Ann Alquist developed um, uh, through her work at Corner House in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Corner House is a child abuse evaluation center whose purpose is to help children describe the abuse they experience, experienced. The interviews are important evidence and Corner House uh, and other uh, child evaluation centers provide in-depth training on forensic interviewing of children. So it's really important um, if you're interested in, in, in doing forensic interviewing to understand that it does it is a specialty and it requires a lot of training and supervision but it's also very important to do because the last thing you want to do when you're trying to help children deal with sexual abuse and when you're trying to stop perpetrators it's really important to keep in mind that you do not want to re-traumatize the children by forcing them to talk about things that are traumatizing. If they're going to talk about things, they need to do it in a setting where they feel safe, in a setting that's a safe haven for them, in a setting where their parents or other people who care for them, they know are nearby. So I'm, I'm, I actually have mixed feelings about forensic interviewing, but I also see that because of, of the risks to children, but at the same time, we have to figure out how to stop perpetrators. And so we have to use our good minds and our good sense and everything we know and everything we care about to figure out how to interview children for forensic purposes in ways that promote their well-being, in ways that are sensitive and responsive to where they are at the moment, and in ways that would connect them to sources of support for the next few months and the next few years because often children require long-term support over the long term um, if they've been sexually abused. But it's also important to know that children can and do recover from child sexual abuse in the safety of secure relationships when they are allowed to feel safe and when um, there are competent people that guide them through uh, processes of dealing directly with their trauma. Again, this is um, working with children who have been sexually abused is, a, is an advanced skill set and it requires a lot of training uh, as what it, just as interviewing children requires a lot of training. Uh, treatment of children, psychotherapy with children who have been sexually abused requires a lot of training. What we're learning in this course is really important information it's, and it's foundational. But at the end of this course, you are not going to be competent to be psychotherapists with children who have experienced child sexual abuse or any other form of child abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm.